Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we have Richard Espin with us, um, who is a product manager with Evanim. He's responsible for the Hyperledger Indie project and the Sovereign Identity Network as part of the contributions that Evanim is making to the Sovereign Network. And he will be talking to a really important subject for us today, and which is important for anyone who's interested in blockchain, which is how open source influences self-sovereign identity. And um, I, I really look forward to this because this is a big subject which really makes possible things like Bitcoin and all kind of other open source um, blockchain projects that really try to push for decentralization. If we check out quickly the second slide, and I'm just gonna talk you through about um, the main aspects of what we're trying to do here with SSI Meetup. So the number one goal we have is to empower global SSI communities. Um, and to do that, we share knowledge with everyone in, in a PowerPoint format, in a video format, that anyone can be used with the CC by share like license, which basically means you can use those slides in whatever way you want. You just need to give credit back to the person doing the, uh, sharing the information and, and the slides, which today will be Richard, and, and to SSM Meetup, and then hopefully you will be using these materials around the world, setting up your own meetups, and, um, and, and pushing for self-sovereign identity and decentralized digital identity so that more people around the world can learn about it. This is completely open to everyone. So um, if you're interested in joining us in the future, um, companies, um, anyone around the world who's not involved in the industry is also um, very welcome to participate or associations or anything. So uh, we try to make it really as broad and simple and accessible by everyone as possible. And yeah, so these are the main things. If you have any questions, please um, just ask during the presentation at any point of time, and I will bring up those questions to Richard. And Richard, um, the floor is for you now, and um, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Excellent, thank you, Alex. Can you hear me okay? It's kind of okay. It, it cuts up a little bit, but it's kind of okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Yes, thanks for everybody joining today. I'm excited to be with you. And as Alex said, this is about the how open source relates to self-sovereign identity. And I recognize that most of the people on this call are probably already familiar with the concepts of self-sovereign identity, as well as probably with the concepts of open source software. And so my goal in this conversation is to try and give you some vocabulary as you evangelize these topics to other people, uh, like Jonah and Nineveh in this example. Uh, that I help you understand how you can convey these concepts to people who might not be familiar with our, our background, our culture, our industry, and to be able to help them understand the importance of uh, wisely selecting their self-sovereign identity solutions. So we're going to start off with a little bit of a background on self-sovereign identity. Uh, hopefully people finding this video later will, will find it useful as a, as a way to get started in this, in, with this topic. But throughout history, there have been a number of carriers of identity, uh, from Egyptian cartouches to signet rings to coinage. Uh, all of those are ways to, to mark something as having originated with a specific person under a specific amount of authority. Uh, keys give, uh, demonstrate authorization or access to something. Uh, symbols of power can involve uniforms, military uniforms or badges or uh, crowns and, and scepters. Uh, these are interesting because they can be, they denote authority within the people that are familiar with the symbols, but they can also be set aside at, at different times or transferred. Also, other examples of, of identity include a, a diploma, which has more to do with uh, when, when you deliver that to somebody, they have to decide whether or not they trust the issuing institution or a government identity card, uh, or even a stamp where you've conveyed this, this sense of uh, of authorization to transmit a message and who it came from and that the fees were paid. Or uh, the license plate allows you to attach your identity to an object in the, in the physical world. But identity can also include, uh, carriers of identity can also include things that you've created yourself. A uh, business card I can generate myself, nobody needs to issue that to me. And the people I share it with can still benefit from the information it conveys uh, depending on how much they trust the that it came from me, that there's no external source of, of authority to that. Now it's interesting, when we take these carriers of identity into the digital world, uh, things change quite a bit. Uh, when we attach a digital identity, quite frequently we rely on a third party to grant that identity to us. 
And so we lose all these benefits that our physical identities have. Uh, when you sign in with Facebook, uh, Facebook always knows, whereas a king can have a conversation uh, with somebody in private, even though he has all these symbols of his authority. Um, similarly, when, when you sign in with, if Google decides they don't want to support your sign in, your identity disappears. Whereas even if the, the issuer of a diploma goes out of business, I can still show people that I had that diploma and, and it was valid at a certain period of time. Uh, and, you know, the examples go on that, that having this, this digital identity that's controlled by a third party is, is dangerous uh, because it doesn't give me the benefits I had with physical carriers of identity that we had historically. And so the goal of uh, self-sovereign identity is to try and bring these attributes of, of identity into the, into the digital world. And you'll hear it referred in a lot of ways, user-centric identity, user-controlled identity. Uh, Gardner calls it bring your own identity, where instead of you issuing identity to your customers, they're gonna, you're going to accept the identity they bring with them. But all of these ideas are, are the same of self-sovereign identity to say that the user is in control of their destiny and of their credentials. Now, it's interesting to look at, a, uh, at how this relates to open source software is one of the technical ways to implement this kind of identity. And uh, I'm going to give you a brief history of open source software, uh, some, of the, some anecdotes about where it came from so you understand the culture, and then we'll show how that relates to the, the movement of, of user-centric identity, self-sovereign identity that people are pursuing today. In, in the early days of computing, the money was in the hardware. Uh, IBM wanted to ship ship mainframes, and the, the fact that there was software running on these systems was tangential. It wasn't where the money was. And so it was fine for people to share that software. There was no uh, to modify it and share it and contribute with other people because that was enhancing the value of the hardware that was being sold. And this philosophy moved into the early days of Unix. Uh, AT&T had a legal monopoly on the phone system in the United States, and as part of that deal, they were told they couldn't compete in, in other markets. And they worked on a, on a computing system with General Electric that didn't work out, and they had a team of developers who were building an offering system and needed a new project. And they had built a space travel game, uh, modeled, modeled the solar system, and, and this, they wanted to get this game working on the machine they had available, a PDB-7. And so they ported it over uh, since they lost access to the, to the machine they were working on. And so uh, it so happened that, uh, th that one of these developers, he, he had a kid and his, his wife went to visit the in-laws, show off the baby to the grandparents, and he had a month to play with this, with this machine, with the PDP-7. And he realized he could take, he wanted to get his space game working, and just so happened he had an operating system and in rudimentaries of a programming language and a compile chain, so he could get, get this system set up. And is, but it was a little underpowered on the PDP-7. So they needed to get it to work. Uh, they wanted a new machine. They put in a requisition for a PDP-11, which is in this picture. And uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie said, look, if, if we can get this new machine, we can help out the patent office in their patent filings. We can build a real-time text editor, what today we would call a word processor. And they got approval to do that. It was kind of a footnote that they'd have to write an operating system and, pro and language in order to get this done. But they did, and that's where Unix comes from. And it made the patent office very happy. And after a couple years of building this system, uh, they, they couldn't sell it, but they realized they could give it out to universities and let people learn how computing works by inspecting the source code. And as an academic tool, it was really effective. They could, uh, lots of people learned about it. They learned how to, to respect the quality of engineering that AT&T was doing. And, and it generated a lot of good ideas, a lot of sharing around improving things. It even started a, a user users group called Usenix, and uh, they in, in started improving the system. But AT&T was absolutely not allowed to support the system. And their lawyers felt like creating bug fixes would, would be one of these problems, uh, would, would undermine that agreement they had with the government. And, uh, but engineers get things done. Lou Katz, the founding president of the, of the use, Unix users group, Usenix, he got a phone call one day saying, hey, if you go to a, a specific spot on Mountain Avenue near Bell Labs, you're going to find a, a, a magnetic tape that will be of interest. And it contained all the bug fixes that AT&T wasn't allowed to release. And they were able to move forward and, and continue improving Unix. 
a lot of these universities that adopted Unix for academic purposes, uh, they really enjoyed improving it and and contributing to the ecosystem. So much that when when AT and T was broken up in their late 80s and started monetizing their their operating system of Unix, uh, they they told these universities to stop redistributing. And these universities re-implemented, specifically University of California Berkeley, re-implemented Unix free of the AT and T code. But it took another 15 years to sort out the patent the patent uh, disagreement. So, but this nature of of software being something that we're building collaboratively, that we're sharing in order to get things done. That, that we need the source code too, so we can learn how it works. That's core to to what Unix culture ended up being. Now, at the same time, in the early 80s, late 70s, uh, there's hobbyists exploring the limits of computing, and they're trying to figure out, you know, the Homebrew Computer Club in Silicon Valley. Uh, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs are trying to figure out what would a personal computer look like, how would it function, and there's software being shared around so people can see how it works, and and that's how they're trying to drive the state of the art and drive innovation. And Bill Gates and Paul Allen are trying to build a business around this software and they see all this sharing is undermining their business model. And Bill Gates ends up writing an open letter to all hobbyists saying, sharing software is theft. You're undermining our opportunity to, our incentive to build software that you want to use. And he sets up this dichotomy between uh, the goals of these people that are sharing to learn and explore and innovate and the goals of the businesses that are trying to uh, commercialize as much software as possible and, and get a maximum return on their investment. Now, it, this time period in the 80s, uh, an engineer at MIT in the Artificial Intelligence Lab, uh, Richard Stallman, he's found his tribe. He's got a group of friends he's working with, and uh, he, he never felt like he belonged before, and here he's got his group of friends at MIT, and they're building software together, and, and he's a system administrator, and he really loves it there. And in this environment, he gets the, he, he fixes a printer driver. And then the manufacturer uh, makes some changes and breaks his fixes. And he needs to get a new spec for the printer uh, so that he can update his driver. And the manufacturer won't give it to him. And he gets rather frustrated. He ends up going to a conference and he finds the engineer he'd worked with and said, hey, I need the new spec. And the engineer says, sorry, I can't give it to you. I signed a non-disclosure agreement. And Richard Stallman gets really frustrated. There's different accounts of, of what the result was, but you know, there's yelling and shouting, and, and Richard Stallman leaves feeling like that engineer who refused to share the specs has breached a moral, a moral boundary that, that he did not fulfill his ethical duty to share. That Richard Stallman had shared a printer driver with the manufacturer, and the manufacturer accepted it, but then the manufacturer did not share in return, and that was that was wrong. And he becomes uh, convinced that that. Anything that prevents collaboration, anything that prevents cooperation is, is morally wrong. And he takes a strong stance that software needs to respect the user. It needs to be free as in freedom, free as in speech. Uh, and, and in order to achieve that, uh, he, he decides that he's going to devote his life to this cause. Uh, many of his friends leave MIT to go work for a proprietary software company, and Richard Stallman moves out of his apartment into his office at MIT, he quits his job, but MIT lets him keep the office, and he ends up spending all of his time trying to duplicate in his open source code base the same work that this new company is trying to do. And he meet, he's an amazing engineer, he meets the, the demand, uh, he matches the output of, of this team of engineers, and, and they, they end up needing to, to close that project because Richard Stallman's duplicating everything they're doing for free. And he sees that as success and says, I'm going to do that for all of Unix. So he starts the GNU project, GNU's not Unix, that's the logo in the bottom right hand corner. And he says, we're going to, proprietary software keeps users divided and helpless, we're going to create open, free systems that anybody can use that respects their users. And he comes up with this brilliant hack that he calls a copyleft, where he takes the idea of copyright law that says, uh, if I share with you, you have to get my permission to to copy that, what I shared with you. And uh, he uses that law to, to attach a license to something that says, hey, if I share with you, uh, you are not allowed to share it with others unless you share it under the same terms as I shared with you. So it creates this level playing field of, of your users will have as many rights as you had. And he codifies that in what's called the GPL, the General Public License of the Free Software Foundation. And we're going to talk about more that more in a moment. 
Um, but it's but the general thrust here is uh, I'm sharing with you. You need to share with other people. We're going to create an ecosystem of sharing, and that's the morally right thing to do. And he's very successful. He ends up duplicating all of Unix except for the core of the operating system, the kernel. And it's in this environment in the early 90s that a, a computer science student named Linus Torvalds gets his new 386 and he's playing with it and he's taking an operating systems class and, and he's learned to, to apply those ideas on his new computer. And he's at home on holiday and says, I'm, and decides he wants to get his email from campus uh, using his new computer and he's going to write the code to do that. So it's got to be able to access the modem. And then he thinks, maybe I can get it to so I can edit my email at the same time that I'm on the modem. So at this point, you've got to put some scheduling in, and he, he uses what he learned in his operating system class and builds a little basic scheduler. And, and then he realizes that if he gets a bunch of these GNU tools, he can fill out a lot of the parts of this, of this system. And he posts it on the internet. And he doesn't think anything's going to happen from it. But a lot of people see this and say, wow, we can add on to, what, to this basic uh, kernel of an operating system and plus the GNU tools, we get GNU Linux, we get an entire environment that's freely licensed. And one of, one of Linus Torvald's friends posts it on an FTP server. He calls it Linux. Linus didn't call it that, but his friend did, and the name stuck. And suddenly there's this movement of programmers around the world contributing to build this system. And uh, Linus Torvalds makes the decision to use the GNU public license, the general public license from the Free Software Foundation, because a lot of the GNU tools are already using it. But he sees that having these clear rules of the road, rules of collaboration, is really beneficial to sharing and to innovation. It, it, Linus isn't worried about doing it for moral reasons. He doesn't see it as ethically better. But he wants to do it because it's better engineering. The results are better. If enough people are looking at a problem, one of them are going to figure it out. With enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. Everybody's interacting for their own reasons. They're scratching their own itch, and yet you get this, this global public good. And when people do proprietary software, it's boring. You end up rewriting the same thing over and over. And we only want to work on the interesting problems. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to, we want to work on the fun stuff, the new stuff, the innovative stuff. And if we do that in the public, then we can all move on to new problems. And fundamentally, collaboration is fun. And there's a group of people who adopt this, this, this viewpoint, and they see the idea of free software is being confusing because people equate it with price. And so they start calling this open source. It's a bit more business friendly of a name. But it goes way beyond software. Uh, you know, in the 90s, GNU Linux starts to become a, a mature enough product for people to use. But people start applying these same principles to art and media with the Creative Commons, where you can get, so where you can get art and books and uh, PowerPoint templates and whatever you're looking for, you can get under licenses that allow sharing. And this movement towards legal access, that the court cases and, and, and legal quote code should all be available to the public for free. Uh, journals these days, many journals are pushing that, that they require the, the data, uh, the scientific data to be publicly accessible in order to publish. Uh, scientific hardware and open hardware, people can, uh, are, are opening the, the firmwares and the specs to laptops and desktops and, and all sorts of devices. And uh, biohacking scares me a bit. It's this idea that people are, are building, sharing genomes online, sharing DNA, you know, synthesizing viruses in their garages. Uh, that could end poorly, but it is part of this open culture of data wants to be free, information wants to be free. We, we should share in order to move forward. And with the advent of 3D printing, even physical devices have open specifications available in the maker movement. And you can download, uh, you know, plans for a shoe or, or a wrench or all sorts of things and then mill it on your own equipment and improve that design and, and share it again. So this open culture goes far beyond software, but it has that common root of, of collaboration is better engineering, of, of information should be available to the user and the user should be able to control their own destiny and be able to work with things without, without restrictions on what they do with, the, with, those, with those plans. So the result is that we end up with, with a, a software system people call FLOSS, Free Libre Open Source, where free software comes from Richard Stallman's statement of, of software that respects the freedom of the user. Uh, but people thought that gets confused with price. Uh, so they labeled it open source. Bruce Perrins calls it open source software, and, and that name stuck. They created an open source initiative to, to 
try and make sure that brand around open source has meaning. But Richard Stone got really frustrated with that term open source because you're not educating users on the importance of freedom. You're not helping them understand that they need to fight for their rights. And so some people say, well, if we use the Latin term libri, that, that connotates freedom, that can help. So free libri open source floss uh, is, is where this, all those terms work in the same ecosystem. From Richard Stallman's perspective, there are four freedoms that a, a program must guarantee in order to be free software. And being all good developers, they number from zero. So Richard Stallman starts with zero, run the program for any purpose. I can't restrict what you're gonna do with it. Uh, freedom one, study how the program works. I should be able to learn how it works and, and access the source code and, and experiment. Uh, redistribute the program without any restrictions. Uh, improve the program and redistribute the improvements. Those are the four freedoms that, that the Free Software Foundation labels free software. The open source edition add the open source initiative approves licenses that fulfill uh, fill, fulfill those freedoms, but they add a few more restrictions uh, on what kind of licenses they accept, a few more criteria, because they want to make sure that people uh, can use these in practice and, and not get surprised by the freedoms they're being given. So many of these things are similar. Uh, you know, derivative works to, to be able to improve software, source code availability, free distribution. But there's also this idea of, of the author's source code. If you're going to make changes, you need to call it something different from the author, uh, unless the author gives you permission. Uh, you can't discriminate against persons or groups or fields of endeavor. So you can't say, uh, People in this country I don't like, they can't use the software, or you can't use the software for weapons uh, or military purposes. Uh, is, if it's open source, you have to allow any use. Uh, that the license can be redistributed, that it's not, too, it's not specific to a product, or it does not restrict other software, or, and it's not tied to a specific technology. Uh, in order to be an open source license, it has, to, it has to meet those criteria. And so if you see the logo on the right of the open source initiative, you know the license being used is one that's going to respect, respect your freedom uh, and give you the rights as a user to redistribute, modify, and, 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 and distribute your modifications. This has become really useful in commerce. I've spent uh, quite a while selling open source software. And people do see that open source initiative label, that brand, is providing value to them as a customer because it tells them that the, the, the manufacturer, because they are offering the source code for free, they've got to really focus on support, on, a, on an excellent customer experience. And it provides the customer with some independence from the vendor, uh, which, can, which can improve the negotiating position of that customer. It's also, especially when you're working with a small company, it provides some risk mitigation. If that company gets acquired or closes shop or whatever, you know you can you have access to the source code, you have the rights to redistribute it, you can continue your business. Uh, because if some companies have a policy favoring open source software, especially a lot of governments do, is that compliance makes it easier to purchase. And there have been a number of times where people, I've asked people, why did you pick my product? And I said, because it was freely available and we could just get started. We didn't have to go through procurement and legal. We could adopt really quickly. And that benefit to open source is really valuable. And some customers really value that ancillary social benefit. That when they're supporting a commercial open source project, that people all over the world are benefiting from that, that investment even if they're not customers of that vendor because the source code is free, is available, and can be inspected and redistributed. As a result, open source software has, the, the term open source has some connotations. Uh, the open source projects have a reputation, it's not always accurate, but it is more often than not, of having a lower price than commercial software, of having better security, I shouldn't say commercial software, than proprietary software, because commercial soft, open source software can be commercial. But uh, having a lower price, having better security than a closed system, having faster innovation because anybody can contribute. The vendors who sell open source projects uh, engage in more transparency with their customers. And that there's more interoperability between the open source uh, product and other products in the ecosystem because people can build on uh, the interoperability they need. It's, again, these aren't always true. Uh, open standards are important alongside open source software, but it provides a, a the, the reputation does exist uh, does, for a reason. 
Now, the, the licensing of an open source project establishes the rules of the collaboration that happens in the ecosystem. It's the rules by which engineers work together and, and, and people decide how they want to commercialize. And Bruce Perrins, uh, the, the person who coined the term open source, he has this, this great way to think about it. He says there's three basic licenses that people should know about when they're selecting an open source solution or when they're thinking about contributing to an open source code base or, or creating an open source code base. The first is the gift license. And he recommends the Apache license. Uh, that's what we usually use it in my, on my team. Um, it maximizes adoptions. It, it, you want a gift license when you're driving adoption. When you're, when you're trying to get standards uh, adopted and broadly implemented, when you're trying to focus on collaboration, uh, and, and it's usually a community-governed project is going to use the Apache license. Creative Commons Zero, uh, BSD, MIT, Artistic License, Public Domain, these are all variants of GIFT license. But the Apache is probably the most widely used one, adds some interesting protections uh, around patents, uh, but generally it says you can do whatever you want, just don't sue me. And that license is really nice because it means if I give it to my competitor, my competitor can stick that in their commercial product. And so uh, my, my investment is going to make it cheaper for other people to use this, which is going to drive adoption and help my standards be, be widely adopted and, and, and implemented. So it provides a very specific business goal. And it's, it's very commercial friendly, very business friendly because it doesn't have any uh, side effects on other products a company might have. The second type of license is the sharing with rules license. And uh, these are the ones Richard Solomon favors in the Free Software Foundation because they're share alike. They're saying, uh, if you use my code, then, then the good things that you get from that have to be under the same license as I gave you. Your users have to be respected. You can't, you can't put this code in a, in a closed proprietary system. Now, in the United States, the copyright holder can relicense under other, other terms. So, in a share-alike ecosystem, if a, co if a single copyright holder controls the code base, then that person's in a privileged position, that organization is in a privileged position, has a competitive advantage over other participants in the ecosystem. So frequently vendors might choose to use a GPL license because they want to use a dual license strategy. They want to say, here, uh, we respect our users, our users get all the benefits of free software, but our competitors in this ecosystem, they, they can't compete on the same level that we that we can. They, can, they can't benefit on our innovation, our investment, our research and development without contributing back under the same terms we did. And so it can help protect the incentive to innovate because uh, it's not just going to be taken by a competitor and, and used against the vendor. Now the problem with this is that people look at a GPL or a share-like license and they use terms like viral. Uh, once you use it in your product, your entire product has to be open sourced. And so it can restrict your, biz your business options and it can make it hard for you to, uh, to be, have a clear title to your own intellectual property. So a lot of companies avoid using software that, that is released under the GPL. Or if they see it, then they try to attain a, a non-GPL, a non-share-like license from the vendor who's providing support. And that resulted in a third type of license, which is uh, an in-between license. It, it says, hey, look, if I share this with you and you improve what I gave you, then you need to share those, redistribute those, those improvements. But you can put it in some sort of larger work, a derivative work, and you can put that under any license you want. So uh, you can still have your proprietary products, you can still protect your business, but the parts of the code that I gave you, you need to contribute what you improve. So this is a nice middle ground for libraries, uh, and it can, it, can, it can help adoption while still providing some protections to the company that's doing the bulk of the research and development. So with that understanding of the culture of open source, of the terminology around open source and free software, and the licensing, the rules of the road of free software, uh, you, you're well prepared to make some decisions around what kind of solutions you're interested in. But there are three books that are really useful for people who want to learn more. Uh, these are all freely available on the internet. Uh, free is in, free in, in price as well as in license. Uh, free is in Freedom is, is a biography of Richard Stallman that, that he reviewed. And it's, it's an excellent read. It's very interesting. He's a fascinating individual, an amazing engineer. And 
uh, is really committed to his beliefs, and he makes some good arguments for why we should all worry about user freedom in a technology in a technological society. Uh, the Cathedral and the Bazaar, written by Ericus Raymond, is a pretty good is probably the best example uh, of the engineering aspects of open source, uh, where a proprietary project is like a cathedral. It's got a single architect, and it's going to take forever to build. And by the time it's actually built, it's probably had three different architects, and the city's moved, but the cathedral can't. Uh, and it's beautiful architecture, but it's not immediately responsive to the needs of the community. Whereas the bazaar, in this example, is the marketplace. Everybody shows up and starts selling. And they're trying to meet their own needs. And as they do that, they generate loads of economic value, not just for themselves, but for everybody in the community. And that's the open source approach. And he has other, he has other analogies like that that help people understand why this collaboration and, and this, this collaboration produces better engineering and why this open source approach is, is so powerful for, for building great products. The third, is, the third book uh, comes from Lawrence Lessig. He's a lawyer at Harvard. Uh, professor of constitutional law, and uh, he wrote a book called Free, in, uh, called Free Culture, where he explains that there are real concerns with uh, everything is a derivative work in society. Every story has an antecedent, and we have to be really careful how much of that, uh, he, how much of our culture we allow to be controlled uh, by people who own intellectual property. And uh, Code 2 takes that a step further and says, in a technologically advanced society, more and more of what we traditionally resolve through democratic processes we resolve through technology. And uh, whether it's your speed camera or whether it's, uh, or whether it's uh, online voting, uh, the code that implements these social processes doesn't provide the same checks and balances that we have built into our government. And that should worry us. Uh, so it's a very interesting example of, of the implications of software on, in democracy and how open source provides rights to users and the ability to inspect and hold vendors accountable uh, and and improve our relationship with technology and society. So let's bring this back to self-sovereign identity. Uh, we've talked about open source and, and the values that it, it, it raises. Now, Chris Allen, a couple years ago, put a blog post where he lays out 10 principles of self-sovereign identity. And this is a pretty good list of, of what self-sovereign identity needs to be in order to be meaningful, what, what an identity solution needs to have in order to be meaningful as a self-sovereign identity. And I bolded the things that are directly impacted uh, by having an, the, the implementation of that identity being under an open source license. So uh, users must have an independent existence from whatever their identity is, but they need to control their identities. And, and open source licenses do give the users that control over the implementation of their identities. Uh, they must have access to their own data, you could possibly bold that because uh, being able to inspect the code makes it much easier for you to be able to get at where your data is stored. Uh, it has to be transparent, and being able to inspect the implementation is a big part of that transparency. It has to be long-lived, and knowing that the code will outlive the vendor that implemented it is one of the big values of open source. Uh, I forgot to tell a story. When I was selling uh, to NASA at one point, uh, I asked them why they picked our solution. They said, we need open source solutions because when we sent the Voyager, uh, the Voyager probe into space in the 70s, there's, no, there's almost no software vendors around today that could still support that solution. And we don't have any idea how long things are going to exist, and so we need to make sure that we have access to the code base and can self-support if necessary. And I see that being really interesting for identity systems. Uh, whether it's 80 years or even longer than the, than the person's life is, is that identity gets used by their heirs, their legal heirs. Uh, these are very long-lived systems. We need to make sure that they outlive the pace of technology, and open source licenses can help with that. Similarly, they have to be transportable between systems uh, as widely used as possible. Uh, users need to consent, uh, and uh, there needs to be a certain amount of privacy that the disclosure of additional information needs to be minimized and, and protecting that right, the rights of the user. So those are 10 principles of self-sovereign identity. You can see how well that overlaps with the way that you know, NASA, for instance, in that, in that anecdote about Voyager, uh, sees the value that comes from having the solution, the implementation of that be open source. Now, I was told when I was uh, practicing this with a friend, he said, you know, you're, you're being really abstract, Richard. Can you make this really concrete? 
I, I said, yes, let's tell a story. And uh, self-sovereign identity involves a lot of cryptography. I mean, all our stories were Alice and Bob. And Alice needs a self-sovereign solution. And so she purchases that solution from Bob. Bob's happy because he sells it to Alice. Everybody's happy. Uh, but in this case, it's a proprietary solution. And eventually, Bob sells to a soulless megacorp. And uh, the soulless megacorp tells Bob, you're not allowed to continue to sell to Alice. Now Alice has lost control of her identity. Bob's a good guy. He's sad about that. But he's got investors. He needs to answer to shareholders. And so he needs to, he needs to get that, that, that investment from the megacorp. And the result is people aren't very happy. So let's say this is an open solution. In, in this open scenario, we have uh, Alice purchased from Bob. Everybody's happy. The Souls Megacorp comes in. Bob's kind of nervous. Alice is kind of nervous. But because it's under an open source license, Alice can contract with Carol to, self, to, support, uh, to support Alice uh, and build her own ecosystem of users. And Bob's happy because he gets the money from the Megacorp. And everybody's happy. Now, the, the question is reasonably asked, so what's in it for the Megacorp? And uh, you know, the Megacorp gets an innovative operating system solution for $64 billion, as a recent sale uh, suggests. Uh, th there's a lot of value in it for the Megacorp. But in reality, the Megacorp's going to, you know, that's the pithy answer. But in reality, the Megacorp's going to look and say, is this a business I want to be in? And if Bob's business is good, build on his open open foundation, the megacorp's going to see that as being a valuable business and want to invest. And, but the megacorp has some, some restrictions on how valuable that investment's going to be for them. Because Alice can always contract with somebody else, can always find a Carol. And so it, it does, in the ecosystem, it creates these checks and balances between the vendor and the user, so that the user has more rights than in a traditional proprietary uh, commercial ecosystem. Now, it's, it's important to recognize this, is, this applies to more than just the code. Uh, Bruce Schneier is a security researcher that I really like. He, uh, in his book, Liars and Outliers, he talks about how do you create trust in an ecosystem. And, and that open source ecosystem, the license is about creating trust between the participants, so they all want to work together. And in an identity ecosystem, you have to have trust in the credentials that are being created in order to want to participate in that ecosystem. And Bruce Schneider lays out four ways that we create trust. Uh, we have morals and ethics, uh, religion and, and family teachings. We have reputational pressure that uh, I will have, there will be societal consequences to, to me uh, acting in a, in a way that's damaging to others because my reputation decreases. There's institutional pressure, whether that's your employer or your government, that institutes some sort of legal framework uh, that creates trust that we can work together. And then there's security systems by which we create technology that enforces trust. And Bruce Schneier makes the point that a lot of our problems with technology and democracy is that we're trying to solve things on the technology layer that are better solved on one of the other layers. And uh, we recognize that in identity systems. So uh, we, Evernim and, and the, sovereign, the Sovereign Foundation, we work together on the Sovereign Network. And we talk about the, the BLT, business, legal, and technical, that it's not just the code, that the open source license provides a legal framework and a set of business models that help support the self-sovereign ecosystem. And that a, an SSI solution needs to think about other ways to encourage trust through those business and legal tiers, as well as a technical solution. Now, uh, SSI Meetup, where we're doing this presentation, we've done other presentations on the BLT, on business, legal, and technical. And we recommend you look at those. Uh, you'll, you'll see one on the sovereign trust framework, uh, where we show how we've been digging into the layers above the code in order to create identity systems that can be trusted. And having that open source foundation that can tr that allowing users to control that, that solution is a key part of that. So I, I recommend you check out those videos. Now, uh, at Evernim, we build this into our business that we need to, in order to have a reliable self-service solution, we need to provide an open source option. It doesn't mean everything we're going to release is going to be open source, but we need to make sure there's that basic open source foundation that so users can trust that their identities are meaningful. And we need to make sure that, it, that we implement open standards. In addition, to, in addition to giving the code, we need to support standards to allow that identity to be transferred in and out and operate over time. And we worry a lot, a lot about privacy by design, private by default, and, and that trust framework which brings it all together. So that's my brief introduction to open source and self-sovereign 
uh, identities. Uh, we only we finished right on time for for a set of questions. Awesome. Alex, uh, uh, yeah, let, let me check if anyone has any questions. Please share them. I have two at least. Um, so let me just bring them up in case no one else says anything for the time being. Uh, just can can you comment on on I mean, in, because you're leading the Hyperledger Indy project, and Hyperledger Indy project, the Hyperledger Indy is uh, has an Apache 2 license. Um, so, okay, can you give a little bit of background about why it has an Apache 2 license instead of having an MIT license, for example, and what the differences are there, and what is an Apache 2 instead of other Apache licenses that you can use? Yes, excellent, uh, excellent question, Alex. So. Uh, the short answer is Indy uses the Apache 2 license because we contributed it to the Hyperledger project, which is a, a set of open source projects related to enterprise blockchains. And, it, and that's governed by the Linux, in, that's part of the Linux Foundation. And Hyperledger requires everything to be an Apache 2 license. So that's the short answer. Uh, the longer answer is, is, as I mentioned earlier, maybe I can get back to this specific slide, is that that gift license allows us to maximize adoption. We want everybody to be able to use the technology we put into Indy, whether or not you're specifically working with, with our network at Sovereign. And so maximizing that adoption, maximizing that, the, the, that's the standards we're trying to promote, works very well with a gift license. Now, MIT is another gift license, and you can use any of these gift licenses to achieve that goal. Uh, the Apache license has specific, uh, MIT is a bit older of a license, Apache says, if, if you're using my code and you sue me for patent infringement, then I can sue you for patent infringement of the code I'm, I'm issued you. So there's a nice protection there for companies that, that use the Apache license, that it creates some security of, around patent fights, uh, patent trolls. But that's really <laughs> the only special thing about that license. Okay. Great. I have another question that came up here. It's like, um, just let me check. Um, can anyone contribute and, and join the Hyperledger Indy project? Uh, yes, uh, anybody can. Uh, now, there's multiple projects at Hyperledger Indy, uh, and each repository has slightly different standards on how you contribute. Um, so uh, I guess I have to leave presenter mode to, to go, get to GitHub. But the um, but it, it, people are welcome to contribute. Uh, the, we use an issue tracker at jira.hyperledger.org. Uh, and we use GitHub to manage the source, and pull requests are accepted. And you can always meet us at chat.hyperledger.org to ask us questions and, and discuss with us what you want to work on. Uh, so yes, anybody can contribute. However, uh, Indie Node, the, the ledger, is fairly complicated, and we have a very high bar for contributions. Uh, the SDK and the agents are, are moving very quickly, and, and uh, so those are easier areas to contribute. Great. Um, I have another question coming up here from Ryan. He's asking, how does React on a Facebook compare? Uh, how does the React license with the Facebook exception? That's my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, Ryan. Um, or he's just, I guess he's writing in. Yeah, he's saying, yes, what's the economic incentive for them to do that? Yeah, it's been a while since uh, since I've looked at that, um, and I'm I'm not a lawyer. I'm just in the industry. Uh, but if I remember right, React is under a, a fairly broad uh, gift style license. But Facebook had a specific claim that said if you're contributing to React, then you give Facebook an exclusive or some sort of special privilege to patents that might be included in this contribution. And uh, Facebook has an incentive to that because even though they're driving adoption and standards with their gift style license, they then end up with a privileged place in the ecosystem that, that they can use these patents in ways that other participants can't. Um, I don't think they were going for that as part of their business. I think it was simply that a lawyer said, hey, this would be nice for us to be able to uh, protect ourselves uh, against patent suits. But the, because any contributor to React, uh, you, you got to be, an open source project has to be careful that all the contributors do have the rights to contribute what they're what they're giving, uh, that they're not using their their employer's code without permission or or stealing the code from a third party and contributing it, because that can create problems for the project. And and I think the license was merely meant to address that concern. 
but in practice has scared a lot of contributors who said, why am I giving Facebook a special right to this code? My understanding is Facebook uh, has changed that. Uh, it's been a while since I've checked, so correct me if I'm wrong. But, but that's a bit, it's a pretty good example of this back and forth of how an open source license creates the rules for collaboration. And the details do matter there. Uh, so using an, open, an OSI, an open source initiative approved license, is really valuable because it, it, it has well-defined, well-understood rules of the road. And so everybody can, can engage with a clear understanding of what those rules are. Yeah, just Brian has uh, another follow-up question. Maybe if you want to comment on that too, he's just, just saying, how does this compare to to Evan and, and, and the Hyperledger, I, I assume the, the license, I mean, like based on, on, on this context? Yeah, so uh, Evernim releases most of our code currently is part of the Indie project under an Apache license. Uh, we've talked about, we, we're going to build commercial products on top of that. And we've talked about whether that's better for us to do is, is proprietary or whether using a, a, a share-alike license would preserve the rights for our users and that open source procurement preference without undermining our, our business strategy. And so we're figuring out some of those things. And so it, every business needs to understand when they're, when they're doing research and development, how will, they, how will they get a return on that investment? And the beauty about open source is that collaboration that, that increased innovation, it can lower the cost of research and development. It can also increase the speed and lower the cost of marketing and sales. It can increase that, the speed of adoption and ecosystem growth. But it does leave you vulnerable to competitors coming in and, and, and taking what you've offered because you offered it. And uh, every business has to figure out the right way to manage that to grow the ecosystem uh, while still trying to respect the rights of the user. Because a self-sovereign solution we need to always pay attention that users need to control those identities. And so we need to find that line in it carefully. So Evernance looked at using multiple licenses depending on our specific goals for, for the projects we're engaged in. Nice. And um, Gideon is asking here, um, are patents are patent compatible with the open source are patents compatible with the open source philosophy, particularly in the crypto space? What's your opinion about patent and open source? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult question, is, is the, the questioner is probably well aware of the, uh, is asking a question because he's well aware of the, the different camps, the different views on this. It, it, is a business, you, people do look for that return on investment, and the legal framework in the United States and, and many countries today uh, use patents as a way to guarantee the, the initial inventor uh, of an, an opportunity to get a return on that investment. Uh, it, the modern open source licenses like Apache 2 and, and GPLv3, uh, they take into account the patent environment in which they work and try to build some safeguards that the patented code that's included in the contribution does not undermine the rights of the user. And so that's one of the advantages to using an Apache 2 versus an older license like Apache 1 or MIT or BSD. Uh, and that's why Apache, uh, the GPLv3 has, has some additional protections there as well. Uh, I think our, I think the rate of innovation would be faster and society would be better served if we were more careful about what we offer granted a patent to and if it was for a shorter period of time. Um, but uh, I'm not a lobbyist or a policymaker, so that doesn't really matter. Uh, but the, from the prospects of, um, of an engineer looking to uh, leverage an open source solution or, or a, a a business analyst selecting an open source solution, recognize that if it's under a, a, one of these modern licenses like Apache GPL v3, uh, you do get some patent protection. And uh, everybody else who's interested about the, cares about these issues should write your congressman or woman, write your congressperson to say, uh, you know, I can't innovate because IBM patents. I, I probably shouldn't call it. Well, IBM's a pretty. <laughs> they patent a lot of silly patents, and we need to make sure there's a higher a higher bar to to what we're gonna grant that monopoly power to. Got you, thank you. I need um, to step off my soapbox now because I could go on that, that rant for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I have another question here from Drummond. He, he's asking about, can you tell us more about the new Hyperledger Ursa pro project for shared, for shared crypto library? Will anyone be able to use that library? Do you know how soon it will be available? Yes, um, Hyperledger, 
Uh, shared CryptoLib is currently in the Hyperledger Labs, and it's it's called CryptoLib. Uh, Lib dash crypto. I forgot. I'm gonna have to check. Uh, they're calling it Ursa. We want to see if that name sticks. Uh, we like that name. So uh, if you hear Hyperledger Ursa, that's what's talking about. But if by the time you watch this recording, the name has changed, it's it's the Hyperledger Crypto Library. Uh, it started as part of the Indie project, but a lot of other Hyperledger blockchain projects want to use it and contribute to it. And so we're we have approval to move that to a top level Hyperledger project. Uh, the code is available now, but it's not any different than the Indie Crypto Lib. So if you if you want to move forward today, you can just use the mature Indie Crypto Lib. Uh, within the next two months, I'd expect to see the the Project Ursa library mature uh, more. Uh, it, it, it entered formal incubation about a, a week or two ago, but we had some problems with the Git repository. It, the history didn't get transferred, so we're figuring out if we can improve that. So if you if you need to go today. I recommend using the Indie Crypto Lib. It should be smooth to migrate in the future. But if you if it's something you want to do in a month, then just look at Git, Git, uh, GitHub in Hyperledger Dash Labs, and that crypto library is there and available for people. And yes, it is Apache licensed. Everybody can use it. And pull requests are welcome. We'd appreciate any pull requests you want to provide. Nice. Um, don't know if there are any more questions coming up. If not, I just have one last question. You you you, you mentioned it indirectly for a moment. Red, Red Hat got acquired recently. I think it was the 64 billion number you mentioned. Um, how, how was that perceived in the open source community? Well, the open source community is a is a diverse bunch. Um, I, I don't I can't speak for anybody but myself. Uh, my opinion was wow, that's a lot of money. Good for Red Hat. And I can totally see why IBM benefits. They need a cloud strategy. They need a, an open source ecosystem. They've been trying to be good open source citizens for almost 20 years now. They're, they're, they are a top contributor to Linux, and, and their open source innovation lab has done some cool stuff. But they're a giant company, and they, they have a lot of proprietary tendencies. And it's, it's going to be interesting to see if they can manage to uh, allow Red Hat's culture to improve IBM uh, instead of crushing Red Hat. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, so it, the you can get a lot of analysis online, but my take is great for Red Hat. They deserve a, a nice payday. From a business model perspective, it, it's challenging. When, as a product manager, when I talk about open source business models, Red Hat's the example of somebody who gives it all away. Everything they do is under an open source license. And having them as a going concern shows the success of that model, that it is possible to not withhold any intellectual property for yourself and still have a very successful, defensible business that gives a good return for investors. Going forward, we can't say that in quite the same way. We can say it was successful once, but uh, it is the market changes, it's, it's going to become harder to prove to investors that that's that's to overcome the concerns of of investors uh, when we ask them to invest in these kind of initiatives so that is a bit of a, a nuance a challenge but uh, it'll be interesting to see how ibm moves forward from here great thank you so much um, um oh just wait a sec i just got another question coming in um, from paul and so Paul is saying, is Hyperledger Labs the best home for SSI projects that go beyond the indie remit ecosystem? Or do you see certain SSI projects coming totally platform agnostic? That's an excellent question. Uh, the, the, I, I do think certain SSI projects will be completely platform agnostic. Uh, Evernim's looked at how we can, uh, whether some of our products projects should should be more uh, agnostic work with multiple backend ledgers and hyperledger indie would not be the right home for those um, the sovereign foundation the other thing is hyperledger indie is focused on enterprise blockchain scenarios and so the uh, an SSI a user controlled identity that is meant to be global uh, interoperable transferable especially working on mobile environments uh, hyperledger isn't focused on those kind of use cases. Uh, they, they don't provide tooling for building on mobile devices, for example. And so the Sovereign Foundation uh, recognizes they need to host a certain number of their own projects in order to uh, build for Android, build for Windows, uh, meet their own, their own needs for their global public ledger. And uh, 
So if, you, if Hyperledger doesn't meet your needs, the Sovereign Foundation might be a good place to host things. Uh, there are other places that, that might be good as well. It, this is a new area, and it'll be interesting to see whether it, people end up innovating all over the internet or whether people uh, join in a, few, uh, in a few common places, a few homes for projects. I don't think that's been answered on a broad scale yet. Great, yeah. Thank you very much, um, Richard. I mean, I'm really happy we had the opportunity to have you here with us today because you, you have a really long trajectory in the open source space and how how to make a living in that space while still contributing in, a, in an open way. Um, and, and to me, it is really important because I, I learned about open source through Bitcoin back in the day. And, um, and I think it's one of the key things about um, trying to make sure that we also make a contribution beyond only um, getting a paycheck and, and really trying to, to, to create open, more democratic systems for everyone. So, and this is really important for SSI. So thank you everyone who joined us today. Um, we will be sharing this recording very soon and please join us in our Telegram channel, in Twitter and the email um, when newsletter that you can join on the website ssimedia.org and all the other channels we have. Uh, we, we usually try to share all this information all across the board. Um, and yeah, if you have any suggestions for future guests, please just ping me. Um, we really want to have all companies, all players in, in, in the space um, participating, and especially because um, the vision we defended as a SSI meetup is that there has to be a future for, for open source SSI protocol driven way of doing things where we don't have single identity silos and um, hopefully we will get there and, and, and that's the little contribution we're trying to do here with by sharing these kind of presentations for everyone to be used. So Richard, thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.